of your life. And uh, some, some very pointed things that the Lord gives us in, in this passage. We're going to start by reading, starting in verse 13, 1 Peter 3. Let me read from verse 13 to verse 17. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. We'll just stop reading there for the moment. You can see as we read through that, just that short passage, that when he gets to that part about sanctifying the Lord in your heart and being ready to give an answer, he's been just talking about those that trouble us, you know, the suffering and, and so on. So, uh, he, he's saying there, there's hope for us when, when there's difficult times. He, we've been looking at this uh, book, and he's been showing us how we can have godly relationships even though we live in a troubled world. You know, that, that's one of the, the blessings of life, is even though there's trouble around us, uh, we can still have good and godly relationships. And we can, we can learn what God says we're to do, even when the other side of the equation is wanting to do us harm. Uh, I think these verses are, are a pretty good summary of, of how we're to live. There in verse 13, um, we need to have a passion for goodness. Who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? Uh, listen, if somebody's going to harm you for doing good, well, so be it. Let's just do right anyway. <laughs> we need to just have a, a passion for, for what's good. We used to sing a little song, Jesus and others and you. What a wonderful way to spell joy. Put yourself last and spell joy. You know, that's, a, that's the attitude we need to have. Not a selfish attitude, but just, you know, we're going we're gonna to do what's right, no matter what anybody else does. Then in verse 14, uh, we need to be willing to suffer. Now, don't go out of your way to suffer. <laughs> I'm not, don't get me wrong here. Uh, but and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, he says, happy are ye. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be troubled. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? It's hard to understand that. But I think the attitude we need to have is we need to be willing to suffer. It's not that we want to suffer, but if we're going to do right, if we're going to have a passion for goodness, listen, God says those that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We need to be willing. Uh, verse 17, it's better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Listen, we've all suffered for doing wrong. Uh, much better to suffer for doing right. Uh, in uh, 2 Timothy 1, there's a verse. It's, it's a great verse. You, you need to know where it is. 2 Timothy 1, 7. He says, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Don't let your life be motivated by fear. Don't let fear motivate what you do. Uh, be willing to suffer. If that's what it takes, have a passion for goodness. And in verse 15, have your focus on Christ. It's so important. Have your focus on Christ. Sanctify the Lord God uh, in your hearts. Uh, there's a special place in your heart that God needs to have. Nobody else, nothing else, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he talks about having answers. Be ready always to give an answer. You know, if, if persecution comes... Uh, Trust the Lord to, to have the answers that you, that you need. And if, if your focus is on Him, uh, hey, eternity, eternity is a, a great place when you know the Lord. And at the end of that verse, in verse 15, rest in the promise of glory. When they ask you a reason of the hope that's in you with meekness and fear, uh, listen, we, we have our hope in the Lord. It's, it's not in this, in this world. And then in verse 16, have a good conscience. Having a good conscience. You know, we, we need to just do what's right. The Bible talks about having a seared conscience or a defiled conscience or a weak conscience. That's not what we want. Uh, we, we don't want a, a conscience that's been warped by how we've lived. Yeah, I, I talk to people pretty regular where 
They've done wrong, but they don't want to admit it. Oh, it's somebody else's fault. It was okay for me to do that because. No, listen, if you have a conscience that's right with God, you'll admit when you're wrong, and you'll confess it and forsake it. Uh, that'll help you when you're in testing. If your conscience is not right, you're going to struggle when testing comes. You know, you, if you've compromised your conscience, you're going to compromise your activities and your, your beliefs and, and a lot of other things. And really, it just comes down to trust the Lord. Trust the Lord in, in all of these things. And, and in this passage, God focuses our attention on the Lordship of Christ. Uh, I think that's what it comes back to. And, and I think the key is there, the beginning of verse 15, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And the question I put to you tonight is, is Jesus Lord of your life? Is Jesus Lord of your life? Uh, where is your hope? Uh, do you have a good conscience? Are, are you willing to suffer for him? Uh, is he the Lord of your life? And, and in the following verses that we're particularly looking at tonight, uh, he brings our attention to Christ. And uh, that's a good place to, to put our focus. Let me read, starting again in verse 17. Uh, he said, It's better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes... I'm sorry, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made sub subject unto him. Those are some interesting uh, verses there. We're going we're to take a look at them. Uh, Jesus is, number one, the triumphant sin bearer. That's what he's talking about there in, in verse 18. Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. And here's the purpose, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus suffered. Uh, it, Chapter 2, verse 21, he says that he left us an example. He suffered. Uh, he suffered unjustly. He suffered unjustly for you, for me, for us. You know, it, it's a terrible thing when you suffer unjustly. You've experienced it, it. It's just a terrible feeling when you're suffering and you know you don't deserve it. Well, listen, that's exactly what Jesus did. I mean, stop and think about how he lived. I mean, of course, you, you'd want to persecute somebody who goes around healing people and giving them free food and, uh, you know, giving them the, the wisdom of the universe. Uh, you know, that's, that's the guy you really want to put down. No, of course not. Uh, Jesus lived a perfect life. He loved and spoke words of compassion and, and blessing. Even when he had to rebuke people, he did it because he loved them and because that was the right thing to do and, and to say. He suffered unjustly for us. That's who he is. That's who he was. And it had a purpose to bring us to God. He did it willingly. He did it knowing that that was what was going to happen to him. And the Bible says it was once. He's not going to do it again. He didn't do it before. He just did it that, that once. It was unique. A unique time in history. All the Old Testament had been pointing to the coming of the Messiah. And here he was. He came unto his own. His own received him not. But as many as received him, you know, that he came. He came once. It was unique. But the, the thing we need to understand is, I'll use a word here, it was comprehensive. <laughs> it, it covered it all. Uh, when Jesus came and suffered and died and rose again, uh, there's nothing else needs to be done. He was able to say on the cross, it's finished. There's, let, me, let me read you a couple of verses from Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. You can turn there if you want. Hebrews 7 gives us some great... Under, Hebrews gives us a great understanding of how the Old Testament and New Testament compare. He says in Hebrews 7, 25, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God, come unto God by him. I love that phrase. Jesus is able to save us to the uttermost. Now listen... Uh, there's nothing that's not covered 
by Jesus' salvation. He's able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Now there's the key. You have to come to God by Jesus, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now listen to this. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. See, it was, it was once, it was unique, but it was comprehensive. It, it, it covered it all. Uh, Jesus is the triumphant uh, Savior. He's the triumphant sin bearer. And the Bible says that he died. And the only reason I, I point that out, it says being put to death, uh, there are those who claim Jesus didn't die. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the Muslims are, are one of them. Uh, oh, he just you know, passed out and came to later. Uh, the Bible says he died. Jesus said he died. And uh, the Bible says then, but was but quickened by the Spirit. Uh, his Spirit was alive. And that, that leads us to verse 19, by which also he had preached unto the spirits in prison. This, this is a real interesting uh, portion of Scripture here. Uh, the triumphant sermon. Now, he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. That word spirits is not referring to people. Uh, later on in verse 20, he talks about people. He calls them souls. He's talking about spirits. Angels are spirits. Demons are spirits. Now, these are spirits that are in prison. Those are demons. Now, let, me, let me show you some, some scriptures on this. Uh, he's referring to evil spirits. Now, most evil spirits are free and are opposing us and serving Satan and so on. Uh, during the time of Christ, there was a lot of demon activity. If you've ever been around demon activity, you don't want to be. It's, uh, it's real and it's, it's, it's terrible. But the Bible says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Um, there's many records in the gospel. I just picked one verse where Jesus had cast out the multitude of demons out of that, the demonic man. And they said, they cried, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? See, they know there's a, there's a time when, uh, when all, all earth will give glory to God. Uh, but the, there's, we're talking here about, about demons. He went and preached unto spirits in, in prison. Some are free. Some are imprisoned. If you look in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, and he talks about Noah there in, in uh, 1 Peter. In, in 2 Peter 2 verse 4, he, he talks about the flood and, and that as well. He says, And God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Uh, there were demons, spirits, that God uh, put into prison at that point. Evidently, there were things going on around the time of the flood, where they had left their first estate, you might say. Uh, in Jude mentions this, Jude verses 6 and 7. And that's, that's where that phrase comes from. In verse 6 of Jude, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. That's not talking about all demons, because some are free to... Uh, to oppose the Lord. And then he says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities and so on, he, he relates it to sexual sin, which is what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was. Uh, th there's a lot of speculation as to uh, what the, the Bible is, is talking about here. But the point is this, uh, God imprisoned these demons. And Jesus, while his body was dead, his spirit went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now, he wasn't preaching salvation. He wasn't you know, preaching the gospel so that they could get saved. Uh, they're demons. Uh, they're, they're not going to get saved, but he was preaching victory. Now, I, you know, maybe we're guessing when we say uh, the devil probably thought he'd won. You know, Jesus is dead. We'll, we'll get the keys from him. But no, his spirit was still alive. And he, I think he probably even held up the keys and said, victory is, is won. Uh, you, you, you've got no, no place. 
We have a triumphant salvation. Uh, there's a verse in Colossians. I've written down here, slow down. I'll slow down. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15 and I think this applies. He says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. There's victory in Jesus. Uh, his triumphant sermon, even while his body was on the cross and in the grave, uh, he was, was preaching victory. And, and that's what we have, a triumphant salvation. Uh, if you look uh, back in, in 1 Peter chapter, chapter 3, and uh, verse 18 and, 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 and following. He begins to talk about the like figure there in, in verse 21. You know, it's, it's interesting if you think about it. Noah preached for 120 years. Yeah, we read that verse in, in 2 Peter. God called him a preacher of righteousness. He had seven converts, his family. Praise God for that, you know. The Bible says he was the eighth person. Eight, eight people were, were saved in the flood. Um, and the ark is an analogy or a type. He uses some words there, the like figure. He says this is a, a similar picture to uh, what we've been talking about with Noah. You know, they entered the ark. We enter Christ. And that's what he's talking about here. Uh, when the flood came, Noah's day, what saved them? It was the ark. It wasn't the water that saved them. It was the ark. Who got wet in the flood? Did Noah get wet? His family? No. The ark got wet. <laughs> it wasn't the people in the ark. The ark took the judgment. See, and that's what the picture is here. The ark took the judgment. Jesus took our judgment. He's our ark of, of safety. Uh, what a picture. Christ. Uh, when the Bible uses that phrase, therefore, if any man be in Christ, man, we need to think about uh, the pictures, but we need to especially think about the reality. We're safe in Christ. It's not the, the water that saved them. It was the ark. Uh, it's not uh, baptism that saves us. It's Christ. Christ took our judgment and our suffering. Uh, we're not saved by a ritual. We're not saved by a ceremony. We're saved by Christ. He's our ark. And the Bible says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. For by grace are you saved, through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And there in verse 21, he, said, he shows that this wasn't an outside experience. He says it wasn't not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. He says this was an inner experience. Uh, it was the answer of a good conscience toward God. And it was by, you see the words there? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was by the resurrection. Uh, we have a triumphant salvation. Uh, triumph over sin. Triumph over death. Triumph over the devil. And in verse 22, and he brings it down to it, he, he says... Basically, Jesus is Lord, who has gone into heaven, Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Jesus is Lord. Now, we use this verse this morning, 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now, we have triumph. We have victory in Jesus. Uh, the Bible says there in verse 22, uh, he's gone into heaven, he's on the right hand of God. In the Bible, that's a, that's a place of, of authority. Uh, several times, let me read a couple of places. Hebrews chapter 1, for instance, in verse 1. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, 
when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You see, there's, there's triumph in Christ. There's victory in Jesus. He's at the Father's right hand. Later in Hebrews 8, verse 1, he says, We have such an high priest who sat on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now, many different places. I've written down a few places here. Romans 8, uh, verse 34 it is Christ that died, yea, rather, that's risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Uh, everyone, everything is subject unto the Lord. There in 1 Peter 3, uh, angels, authorities, powers being made subject unto him. It kind of reminded me of Ephesians uh, when he talks about uh, principalities and powers and so on. You know, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against wickedness in high places. Well, Jesus has victory over that. Principalities and powers. Everything, everyone is subject unto him. Probably many people's favorite verse would be Philippians chapter 2 and uh, verse 9 when he says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue should confess. Someday that will be true. Every tongue will confess. And the, the point here tonight is, is he Lord of your life? Has your tongue, has your mind, has your will uh, been given over to the Lord? Uh, he says there in, in 1 Peter, all of these things are, be, are being made subject unto him. Are you subject unto him? Is Jesus Lord of your life? Jesus is Lord. Is he Lord of your life? There's so many lessons here. Uh, one uh, that I really enjoy, we have victory in Jesus. <laughs> uh, the victory's already been won. We, we don't have to pray for victory. We just uh, look forward to it. The, the other lesson that, that I particularly notice is through unjust suffering, Jesus triumphed. And through unjust suffering, we can be like Jesus. Well, we, we don't necessarily like that lesson, but it's true. Uh, he brings us, chapter 4 comes up, and here's, here's what he says in the first verses of chapter 4. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. That's what he's bringing us to. Jesus is Lord. Uh, getting us to quit trusting ourselves, quit trusting our flesh. He, he says in uh, 1 Peter 3.15, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Uh, that's the message of this passage. Uh, let me ask you this. What is God's place in your heart? What is God's place in your heart? I guess probably from day to day, maybe there's, maybe it's different. But he needs to have first place. Jesus needs to be Lord. Uh, there's so many good songs that have been written about this. I was thinking of one. I, I didn't find a copy of it. Let me lose my life and find it Lord in thee. You know, what, are, what will a profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Let me lose my life and find it, Lord, in thee. There's a song we sing about Jesus asking us, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? This morning we looked at our reasonable service. Our reasonable service is that we give it all to the Lord. Uh, take your eyes off of self and put them on Jesus. Let me encourage you tonight. I, I, that, that's a constant battle day by day to, to do that. Look through your suffering. Don't just look at your suffering. Look through your suffering and see Jesus. He suffered unjustly for you to bring you to God. And God says he can use that same kind of thing to help you be godly, to be like Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And what a blessing. Romans 8, 28, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God has a purpose in all of this. 
And his purpose in his suffering was to bring us to God. His purpose in our suffering is to be like Jesus, to teach us the character that we need to know. There in 1 Peter 2 and, and verse 21, Not the verse I want, sorry. Good way to end a sermon. Um, uh, I've, uh, I guess I've, I've struggled tonight preaching. Um, I was struggling with the singing. <laughs> um, and I think the Lord has a message for us tonight. And it's not in how I present it, but it's in the Word of, the word of God. And... Uh, you know, there's, there's so much we can, we can learn from this. I hope that you'll take it to heart. Um, having a good conscience, sanctify the Lord God in, in your heart. Uh, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Uh, that needs to be us. We need to be subject uh, to the Lord. I, I thought we'd finish with the song in our hymnal number 10. I have decided to follow Jesus. And that's a song of commitment. And I guess really we shouldn't sing it if, if we don't mean it. Uh, but let's, let's take our song. I'll, I'll just go ahead and lead that. Uh, I have decided to follow Jesus. I guess I know it. I'm just thinking as, as we we're singing, the Bible talks about counting the costs. Yeah, it'll, it'll cost us to follow the Lord. But you know, ultimately, it'll, it'll pay. Uh, I'm looking forward to glory. Uh, I'm looking forward to all that, that the Lord has for us. But in this life, you know, we have to decide. We need to be willing uh, to, to follow the Lord, uh, whatever that cost. I encourage you tonight, uh, get, in, get into your, your Bible and, and see what the Lord has for you. Count the cost. Uh, listen, there's nothing you'll give up for the Lord that won't be worth it. <laughs> you know, uh, there's nothing that's, that's worth coming between you and God. Let's go to him in prayer and, and we'll be dismissed. Father, we are so grateful for your word. Uh, thank you for loving us and, and Lord, for suffering for us unjustly and yet doing it to bring us to God. Thank you. Uh, Father, I pray if there are any here tonight that are not saved, that your Holy Spirit would help them to see that they need to trust you, that they, that they need to give their heart to you. Lord, I pray for Christians. Help us to live for you. Help us to be willing to live day by day and moment by moment in light of your word, loving you. Uh, thank you for a good evening and for your blessing. Uh, take us home, Lord, safely and help us to be the witnesses that we should be. And uh, We do pray for the, the Loves family and uh, for their loss at this time and ask your blessing and help and encouragement that you use it for your glory and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.